You can see here a six-stage centrifugal compressor rotor. The assembly drawing of the same rotor is shown in this figure. Any compressor rotor, regardless of its type, consists of various components mounted on a shaft. For centrifugal compressors, these components are the impellers, the seal color or sleeve, the thrust color, the shaft sleeve, the balanced drum, and couplings. Mounting of these components will be discussed later in this section. The rotor shaft end must be designed to transmit the maximum torque provided by the driver. Torque is equal to horsepower per unit speed, as seen here, where BHP is the brake horsepower and N is the shaft speed. From this relationship, it is obvious that torque will increase with increasing BHP or decreasing speed. All compressor manufacturers have a limit of maximum allowable shear stress for shaft ends. This limit varies between 12,000 PSI and 15,000 PSI. The most common shaft materials are ANSI 4140 and ANSI 4340 steels, which have a shear yield of roughly 36,000 PSI. The relationship for shaft shear stress is seen here, where T is the shaft torque and D the shaft and diameter. From this relationship, the designer will determine the shaft and diameter. Also note that the shaft diameter at any point along the shaft can also be found from this equation if the torque at that point is known. I have often been asked why the thrust color is always at the shaft end opposite to the coupling. As we have learned in a previous section, the objective in bearing design is to provide a maximum bearing surface area. By positioning the thrust color at the end of the shaft, where there is the lowest torque, the required shaft diameter is the smallest. Therefore, the smaller the shaft bore, the greater the area available for the thrust color. Shaft ends can be designed either for hydraulic or keyed coupling fit. Hydraulic fits are usually used for compressors in hydrocarbon service, since the coupling must be removed to disassemble the shaft seal, and heat required to remove a keyed coupling would present a safety hazard. Coupling fits and mounting procedures will be discussed in the next section. Referring again to the assembly drawing of a typical centrifugal compressor rotor, the rotor natural frequency is directly proportional to the shaft stiffness by the following relationship, where K is the shaft stiffness and M is the mass of the rotor. Rotor stiffness is proportional to bearing span divided by the major shaft diameter as seen here. Here, the bearing span is the distance between bearing centers. Now, an interesting rule of thumb is that dynamic compressor rotors with stable vibration characteristics usually have a K value higher than 10. So, I strongly advise you to calculate this value prior to any investment or purchase and always ask for references of compressor units operating in the field if K is higher than 10. It is really important to confirm satisfactory field operation of these units before purchase is made.
there are three basic rotor configurations and these are single stage overhung, multi-stage series and multi-stage opposed arrangements as depicted here. Usually single stage overhung and multi-stage opposed arrangements do not incorporate a balanced drum since the rotor thrust values are low enough to be accommodated by a thrust bearing. Multi-stage opposed designs are usually used in high pressure applications. However, if the rotor were a series configuration, as seen here, failure of the balanced drum seal would cause catastrophic damage since the thrust bearing would immediately fail. An opposed rotor designs, as depicted here, would eliminate the requirement for a balanced drum since the impeller thrust forces are opposed. Therefore, the thrust loads will always remain low since the rotor is naturally balanced. All centrifugal compressor rotors are built-up type, that is, the major components are not integral with the shaft and must be shrunk on. So let's see in details the requirements for impeller shrink fits. The forces acting on an impeller that create impeller stress and require positioning stress or shrink fit are centrifugal force, gas load, so the force from the torque, thermal difference between impeller and shaft, and thrust force. The impeller must be designed such that the shrink fit, so the shaft diameter minus the impeller bore diameter, is sufficient enough to maintain impeller shaft contact at maximum conditions. So the amount of shrink fit required for impellers can become large. Typically, impeller shrink fit values range from 0.002 to 0.003 inches shrink per inch of shaft diameter. Let's say that the rotor that you can see here has a shrink fit in excess of 0.04 inch for each impeller. In this case, the impellers would have to be expanded in excess of 0.04 before mounting on the shaft. Typical mounting stresses are 20,000 to 30,000 PSI. Therefore, thermal or hydraulic means are required to expand the components to be shrunk on the shafts. All multi-stage rotors utilize a thermal means of assembly, like a furnace for instance. For these rotors, assembly is performed vertically as depicted here. This is done for ease of assembly and to minimize residual shaft stresses. Single stage rotors usually use hydraulic methods for rotor assembly and disassembly, since most designs require impeller disassembly for mechanical seal removal. Now, regardless of the method of rotor assembly, residual stresses remaining after assembly can deflect the rotor. Small amounts of rotor deflection can cause large amounts of rotor unbalance. If a rotor is low speed balanced in a deflected state, high amounts of vibration due to rotor unbalance will be experienced in the field. This is because the normal forces on the impeller will remove the residual shaft stresses at operating speed, resulting in an unbalanced rotor. In order to prevent this occurrence, check the rotor deflection before and after the addition of each impeller to the shaft. If the runout or deflection changes by more than the limit indicated here, then the impeller must be removed and reassembled. 
Keep in mind, the usual cause of shaft deflection in a compressor is the inadequate expansion of the component prior to assembly, which results in a mounting on the shaft, which is not even. For these reasons, I recommend you that only qualified repair facilities should be used for rotor assembly and disassembly. Finally, before leaving this subject, I would like to mention that all other components must also be shrunk on the shaft. However, their shrink fit values per inch of shaft diameter will be considerably lower since they do not carry a torque load. Typical shrink fit values for these components are seen here. A rotor is considered to be balanced when the center of rotation or the shaft center line coincides with the center of rotor mass. All compressor rotors are balanced to a specified limit that will allow the rotors to operate in the field with a minimum of shaft vibration. The most common criteria for allowable shaft vibration during vendor test is defined by the American Petroleum Institute, API, as follows. Here, RPM is the maximum continuous speed. Examples of allowable shaft vibration are seen in this table. Now, in order to obtain these values of allowable vibration on test, Vendors use the following API guidelines to determine the allowable level of unbalance. Here, W is the shaft weight at the journal bearing location, and N is the shaft speed. The standard rotor balance procedure is to progressively balance the rotor to establish limits of 4 W divided by n at low speed. By low speed, I mean roughly 500 rpm. A progressive balance procedure is based on using previously balanced components and checking the balance against the limits after the assembly of each major component. There are many variations of this procedure. But keep in mind to review all your repair shop balance procedures prior to start of work. Many end users require all shop rotor balances to be witnessed. Recently, some vendors have eliminated progressive balance and are using high speed balance. This procedure reduces balance time and cost but requires that successive rotor balances must always be performed at high speed, since there is no low speed reference balance. More importantly, the contributing source of rotor imbalance is hard to define, since a progressive balance was not performed. I personally always require a low speed progressive rotor balance, and in certain cases, a high speed check balance should be performed. If corrections are required, it is because the mode shape of the rotor at operating speed is significantly different from the mode shape of the rotor at balance speed or at low speed. So that you are aware, over the last 10 to 15 years, high speed rotor balance has been popular. High speed balance procedures were originally designed for highly sensitive rotors with low values of rotor stiffness that had a history of field vibration problems. High speed balanced machines have the capability of balancing the rotor at rated speed. This is done by operating in a vacuum and providing sufficient power to operate at this speed. Finally, to finish off this video, the applications that can benefit from high speed balance are newly designed sensitive rotors, new or spare rotors 
so rotors that have been disassembled and will not run in their casings prior to field startup. And finally, test cells for spare rotors. As a precautionary measure, I advise you to confirm the effectiveness of a high-speed balance facility by checking past users to confirm that the balance level achieved in the high-speed facility was repeated in the field.